Hey stackers, before we roll on today's rewind episode, just want to give a big shout out to the women and men serving in the armed forces to protect our country. They're the reason why we get to continue stacking Benjamins. So on behalf of Navy Federal Credit Union and the Stacking Benjamins team, big shout out to our armed forces. Let's get rolling. Please hold for an important message fresh from the basement. No, no, no. Hang the streamers over by the, 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 pe- the peaches the, and really twist them up. We, we're going all out. Make them really streamery. Oh, hey, stackers. The fin turn is going to be here momentarily, but are you ready? Tonight is our big YouTube event, The Stack. It's absolutely free and is 70 minutes of money inspiration, fun, and some great money tips. We aren't going to tell you who our guests are, but but it's going to be great. So this morning, our big guest rolled up in his trailer and what a posse he's got with him. Whoops. Did I say he? Sorry. Well, I guess that's another hint. At least I didn't say that our other guest is here too, and she... Oh, crap. Well, time for me to stop talking. Join us for the best chat window in finance geek event land, and as always, the greatest money show on earth. It's all on YouTube at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time. We'll send you an email letting you know we're going live if... You join the Stacker, our email newsletter service at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stack. See you tonight. All right, Finn Turn, you're up. Pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement, welcome to a Wednesday Rewind episode of the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, or like the guys in the basement make me call myself, the Finn Turn. Well, as you heard from neighbor Doug, it's chaos down here in the basement. Cameras are set up all over, OG is going to stand over by the peaches, and Joe's got a desk over by the hot water heater. Joe's mom's been dusting everything, and Gertrude's dusting off the shortwave radio. I remember talking about this event at the beginning of the year. Can you believe it's already March 3rd? Because spring is only a few weeks away, here's a stark reminder for all you parents out there with seniors in high school. That first college business office payment is coming up too, and I heard that that can be pretty rough. But don't freak out yet. Because even if you're still a little behind on that particular money curveball, there's still time left for you. To that end, I'm bringing you an episode we titled Lessons from a College Planning Wizard with Jody Oaken. And I can tell you that that's not an embellishment. Jody has a lot of great ideas to help foot the university bill. Things change often in college planning land, so if she talks about specifics of planning, realize that this episode originally came out in 2016. And while you might notice some changes in specifics and in the way we do the show, you'll find that Jody's advice is timeless. Enjoy, and hopefully we'll see you tonight at the stack. Now I've got to go make some lemonade for our guest stars. Boy, do we have some cool guests coming tonight. Fintern out. Hi, this is Daryl Close. And when I'm not up at 2 a.m. feeding a newborn, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from the place where snow cone and push-up dreams are made, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everybody, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I should say, soon to be ice cream and snow cone entrepreneur, Doug. And it's a big day in the basement. Snoop Doggy Dog is coming to collect payment for being my spokesman. The fee... Mom agreed to make some of her special brownies, and man, he is way more excited than I thought he'd be. But even more exciting, with us today, college planning expert Jody Okin. Also, a headline about why the average investor doesn't make money, a quota see hotline call about investing in Canada, don't you know, and your letters from the mailbag, my amazing trivia. And here they are. Two guys who could seriously use a delicious lemonade chiller at the right price, Joe and Oh J-J-J-J-G. I'm not a big fan of the lemon ices things. Are it's, you? It's too tart. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. I mean, they make them even in strawberry, and I just, yeah. 
I'm an old fashioned. I just like the soft serve chocolate. If you know what I mean. <laughs> I, don't, I don't wait. <laughs> that was good. I love it. We should keep that on the show. You know what else you love? Any credit card can offer cash back, but only Discover matches all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year. It's like getting one of those birthday cards that's shaped like cash. So you already know there's cash inside before opening it. But in this case, it's stuffed with your first year cash back match, and you don't even have to send a thank you note. Cash back match only by Discover card. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Discover something brighter. Great show today because not only is Snoop Dogg upstairs with Do- what's that all about? It's like old school, right? Like where everybody's waiting for like the real like coming to you live. A big sound city welcome. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wild if we could get him to come downstairs? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you will, but we I can try. I don't know either. But Jody- what you should do is wear a wire. <laughs> Better than that though. And, and probably more useful for people that think we're actually might teach them something. We're not going to teach them something, but Jody Oaken is here. Jody Oaken, of course, is the financial aid expert. She is America's financial aid expert. Doesn't have to be difficult is what we know. And Jody Oaken is going to tell us how to maybe make this whole college experience, whether it's for you, for a family member, maybe there's somebody, maybe if you're not going to college yourself, OG, and don't have anybody that's uh, in your immediate family, and they're done that. maybe it's time to tell a family member, start listening to the show, because Jody Oaken's here. This is probably the only episode they'll want to listen to, but that's it. But first, we've got some wild headlines today, so let's move. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins Headlines. First headline comes to us from Investopedia, and this one's written by Greg DePercio. It says, why investors don't make money. You know why the average investor doesn't make money, OG? Because they're stupid. <laughs> In 2000, <laughs> except people listen to this show, and they are brilliant. In 2000... Uh, behavior. 2015 Delbar's quantitative analysis of investor I love behavior. The QAIB. <laughs> yeah. I have it. I, I buy it every year. It's worth it. It's funny because when people hear the name Delbar, they go, Really? What the heck Dilbert? is that? Yeah. Dil- I, I, that's, that's what I think of. When I hear Delbar, I think Dilbert. They, and this is almost as funny, reported that the average 30 year analyzed return for investors annualized in, in blended mutual funds. So that's the average annualized return. Average return of the average fund. No, the average investor, not the fund. Oh, we're on the investor part first. We're just talking about the investor. Well, shouldn't you just lead up to it by telling us what the investments did and then back into the investor? That's kind of a bigger shock factor. Well, w- I'm not telling you how to run your business here. You just do you, baby. <laughs> Let's do that. The Standard & Poor's 500 index advanced over the same period, which was the last 30 years, 10, 30 years. 10.35% per year. Per year on average. And the bond index, why don't I give you that? The sure. Barclays aggregated bond index gave you 6.73. Those are pretty good returns. 30 years. Sounds great. Sign me up. Fantastic. The average, what does person, the average person do that? Investing in blended mutual funds between the two of those did 1.65. Oh, snap. And people that so invested. What do you do to give up 9% a year return? No, 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 no. Some people gave up even more because, you know, some people won't touch the stock market because they don't understand inflation, right? So they only invest in bonds. Average bond investor did 0.59. Oh, baby, I got to get this report. Mine is from a couple years old. I haven't bought this year's well, yet. I'll tell you what, I'll have it on the show notes at stackybenchments.com and you can look cool. for it there. Yeah. Investors have themselves to blame, according to Greg here, when assigning fault for underperforming the market so severely. Several decision-making errors prevent average investors from fulfilling their potential. I like that. Investors have this potential that was 10.35. Or, you know, if you invest in an index like the S&P 500, you're going to get a little bit less than that, right? Because there's a management fee. But what? Sure. Okay, 10.2. Pick any number greater than one, (laughs) but less than (laughs) 10.3. And I agree with you. They avoided profit taking on winners and failed to cut losers with poor long term outlooks. They chased popular stocks instead of following Warren Buffett's advice and seeking out the ones the market undervalues. Lastly, average investors take risks not commiserate with potential rewards. I don't think any of those are the reason. Like, I heard all three of those. Uh, yeah, I mean, the risk one is kind of a foo foo answer. Yeah. And like, the- do you really need to know when to take on winners and fail to cut losers? You don't need to know any of that. 
Yeah, not if you're doing an index. I know. You don't need to know that. The average investor could have just bought and hold. And even in an active mutual fund, right, with an active manager that got its butt kicked by the index, and they still would have done much better than 1.65. Yes. It's interesting because this is exactly why we say the wrong dragon, you know, when you're fighting the wrong dragon, when people start talking about, well, this internal fee is what's killing you. And that's not what's killing you. It's behavior that's killing you. And making a better decision because you've got a little bit lower internal cost. That's the, that's the cherry on top of the Sunday. Yeah. You know, that's the cool part, but uh, boy, to give up 9%, this is 100% behavior, right? I mean, isn't that what you're going to say? Absolutely. I yeah. love the study, but as I read through the rest of uh, Greg's article here and uh, th- 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 this is horrible. I mean, a smart, oh, atrocious, yeah. a smart investor knows his time. No, no, no. I'm saying, oh, you're saying his article. I'm saying the author, the author talks about a smart investor knows his time horizon, makes buy and sell decisions accordingly with the 20 year time horizon. The best time to purchase new shares is when the price drops. You don't even need to do that. If you knew that the price was dropping tomorrow. No, <laughs> the best time to the, the, yeah, just buy, buy all the time. Buy it. You just put the money in. Just buy it and hold it and don't sell. Just put your $200 a month in or $500 a month or 1000 bucks a month and be done with it. And then don't jump off the cliff when everybody else does. Yeah, I do agree with chasing popular stocks. Yeah, you see people well, yeah, that go that for the hot thing. I mean, look at that. But anyway, as I mentioned, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Second article comes to us from Financial Advisor Magazine. It's fa-mag.com. Oh, gee, you came down to the basement with this one. Sell everything is the quote. Sell ah, everything. Double yes. Lines Gunlock says, Jeffrey Gunlock, the chief executive of Double Line Capital, said on Friday that many asset classes look frothy and his firm continues to hold gold, a traditional safe haven, along with gold miner stocks. Would people stop saying that gold is a traditional safe haven? <laughs> what do we have to do to get people to stop saying that garbage? It's, it's, Although I guess it is a safe haven, right? It doesn't. It neither appreciates nor depreciates, I suppose, right? It, yeah, right. It barely keeps up with inflation over the last 200 years, something yeah. like that. It's it's crazy because the only way you're safe in gold. So now let me is, get this straight. This guy's to- a, fund, uh, a fund manager. What is his specialty? What does he manage? He's the chief executive of Double Line Capital. Double Line is a, would you say that's an equity company or do you guess more that that is a fixed income? focused firm. You know, it's funny. I didn't even look at that to see what just, they do. Just guess. Oh, they- I already know the answer. So go ahead. <laughs> what do you think? They are definitely fixed income. Oh, absolutely. Positively, Luli. So really large bond fund manager is telling you, get out of equities. Uh, that's weird. Huh? Yeah. Huh. But he's screaming it really loud. So we should definitely pay attention now. First thing to do whenever you watch CNBC, read an article, whatever is examine the source hit mute (laughs) (laughs) well you want to know what's funny too is that this article was from july 30th okay so it's been another and the market and and maybe the market collapses between the short time that we record this and the time that the show goes out but i don't think it's going to it would be something wouldn't it and and the market hasn't fallen yet maybe the market's going to fall tomorrow he's expecting a worldwide collapse and not just a not just a it went down a little bit he's Everything, sell everything now. I love this quote of his. The artist Christopher Wool has a word painting. Sell the house, sell the car, sell the kids. That's exactly how I feel. Sell everything. Nothing here looks good, Gunlock said in a telephone interview. The stock markets should be down massively, but investors seem to have been hypnotized that nothing can go wrong. Now, get this. Should have been down massively. Back, Back to your point. He said the firm went maximum negative on treasuries on July 6th when the yield on the benchmark 10-year treasury note hit 1.32%. But he said, remember he said sell everything with stocks? Here's what he said with bonds. Quote, we never short on our mainline strategies. We never go to zero treasuries. We went to lower weightings and change the duration, Gunlack said. So Gunlack said, sell all your stocks. But when it comes to bonds, I don't sell everything. Yeah. Yeah. But we went negative a couple of weeks ago. Is that not just like double talk? Is that not just like coming out both ends of the mouth? It is whatever you need to do to keep the cash rolling in is what it is. So are fund managers more asset managers or marketing pros? Right. Good point. I think you got to be both. But historically, they've been better marketing pros than asset managers. If you just look at the numbers. I think you're right about that. Yeah. 
Managing your money has typically been complicated, time-consuming, and just another reason to bite your nails. But for half a million investors who have accounts with M1 Finance investing smarter, more automated, and easier than ever, do yourself a favor and check out M1 this year. This finance super app is designed to be personalized for your needs and their automation tools make it simpler to reach your financial goals. With M1, you can invest how you want with access to fractional shares and unmatched automation for free. You can borrow against your investments at super low rates, just two to three and a half percent and use this flexible line of credit for anything like investing more into your portfolio, refinancing other loans or funding large projects. M1 ties it all together in a free digital account. So you have more flexibility and smoother money movements. Just keep in mind, borrowing involves higher risks and rates may vary. Visit m the number one finance.com forward slash SB to sign up. And because you're a stacker, you're going to get 30 bucks off to invest, not off to invest uh, $30. So you can go off and invest at M1. <laughs> Uh, I love it. Again, that's visit m1finance.com forward slash SB to sign up. You get $30 to invest. If you do, terms and conditions apply. So I think our lessons sell everything. Mm, maybe not. And number two, the reason you're not making any money is it's because you're listening to dingbats like that dude. <laughs> Man, college isn't what it was when you and I went. I heard that. Sometimes I think prepping for college should be an all, a full-time job. Of course, if I had done a better job of prepping like how college worked and I knew how financial aid worked, I would have probably done a better job of paying for it quicker. That or maybe made a different uh, college choice, right? <laughs> not college choice. What are you talking about? No, I'm, no I, don't, I don't mean, I'm not, I'm not oh. saying that you went to a crappy college. I mean, I thought that was a did, Spartan but- joke. Well, you turned it into a Spartan joke. I mean, I'm sorry that you're offended Easy. by the fact that your college sucks, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I, have, I have a funny thing to tell you that I saw after we had done here. A funny thing about a thing. It's really cool. You'll laugh. That's great. In, in any event, I was listening to uh, Malcolm Gladwell podcast, and he is uh, he's an interesting person cool. to listen to. He's a quirky bird. Yeah. But one of the things he says, uh, which I happen to really agree with, is that one of the biggest mistakes people make with college is picking a college that has nothing to do with what they want to study or what they can afford. But rather they go, but all the cool kids are going to (laughs) or my boyfriend's going to without regard for what the outcome of that is going to be. Same thing with like picking college majors. Right. That's funny. But I really like underwater basket weaving. It's like, okay, we're not spending $50,000 to teach you how to do that. A friend of ours on our bike ride this last weekend was telling Cheryl and I that her daughter all of a sudden uh, wants to go to Oklahoma, like has these other two colleges she wants to go to, but Oklahoma made the list. And then she found out why Oklahoma's on the list. Boyfriend goes there. Boyfriend's thinking about it. Right. Yep. And you know how long that's going to last once they leave yeah. Texarkana and they head for, for big old Oklahoma. <laughs> Greener pasture, so that's, to speak. Uh, like, wait, there's more than six girls? Right. Or or, oh, or, no. or or don't give all the credit to him. There's more than six dudes. Yeah, that's probably like, the right Like, I got this doofus from Texarkana when I've got all these guys. Look at all these guys from <laughs> Dallas. Whoa. They have a full set of teeth. <laughs> well, not these fellas from Oklahoma, but... All right, Jody's waking up upstairs of Bob, so we got to talk about her. Jody Oaken is a dynamo. I see Jody Oaken all over social media. She's the founder of College Financial Aid Advisor, CFFA. She's helped thousands of parents successfully master the financial aid process and open educational possibilities for their children, regardless of cost. You know what? Doesn't have to be for kids, OG. Could be for you, too. She hosts the College Cash Twitter chat devoted to connecting college-bound families with higher educational professionals. More than 10 million impressions per week. College Cash is a top resource for parents and students, and she's about.com's money expert. Too bad Jody's not busy. Let's say hello to Miss Financial Aid Planner herself, Jody Oaken. And Jody Oaken joins us in the basement. Welcome. Hi, how are you, Joe? I'm so much better now that you're here, Jody, because I feel like I've known you forever. Like you've been my Twitter buddy for, I don't know, maybe the last four or five years. 
Yeah, well, I've definitely been on for four or five years, and I love that we're finally actually chatting. This is great. We're going to have such a good time today. Well, I know we will because whether it's people putting themselves through school or putting Junior through school, that this is a this is a tough area. How did you first get involved with figuring out the intricacies of how this whole system works? Well, I actually worked at Occidental College in Los Angeles, California. I took an online class about financial aid and the teacher of my class at UCLA was the director at Oxy. And I called her up and I said, hey, I'm going to be in the area. Would you chat with me and have coffee? And she said yes. And we talked for about two hours. Long story short, I asked her to hire me and teach me everything she knows, and she did. And that's how I started. And what's funny is, is that I bet that discussion was like just the tip of the iceberg because what you need to know goes pretty deep. Yeah, I I worked there for five or six years. And as I was working there, I started helping families privately. And then, you know, next thing you know, it's 10 years later, you know, we met on social media, I hopped on social media. So I think the key is also, you know, staying very educated and up, as you know, it's probably complicated industry. So I I have to do a lot of professional development in order to help my families who are currently going through the process. Well, speaking of professional development, let's start off with people trying to put junior through school. And then I'll ask you some questions about people who maybe want to go back to school that are listening that don't have kids. For people putting junior through school, you say that this thing, you've got to start way earlier than you think you have to. It's like starting at the start of senior year isn't good enough. Starting at at senior year isn't good enough. You really need to start having the conversation in middle school. So in middle school, you're saying to your student, you know, if parents are listening, you're saying to your student, hey, what do you like to do? You're having you're starting that dinner table conversation and getting in the mode of talking to your students about bigger pictures. And that's going to ease into that senior year in high school. But I notice, you know, at my kid's school, I remember my kids in seventh and eighth grade, Jody, I I wasn't thinking anything about like whether my kid was going to be valedictorian or not, but even that stuff starts early. Right. And, and you know what, Joe, I think what you just said was super key, you know, probably for your listeners too. There is a lot of talk and there is a lot of community pressure and peer pressure in that sense. And that's where you can start the conversation of your family, just like just doing you guys, like you do you. And you do your family and your student's journey. And don't worry about, I know that's happening, but try to focus on your student's talents and and what's good for them and what's going to be a path that's going to be comfortable for them. That's what you're talking about. When should we start doing like the college visits and and getting the, the child comfortable with where they might go away to? Anytime, you know, middle school, high school, if there's an older sibling, you know, make sure you take the younger sibling on the visits. Or if you have local colleges, maybe you're going to an art fair or something just so they can see what it's like. Junior year tends to be the big year during spring break to go far away if students are thinking of going out of state to take care of those visits. But one or the other And both would be great. Also, you know, they have these virtual tours online that are great. Oh, you mean where I can just sit in my, I can sit in my computer with a box of donuts and just look around the school? Box of donuts, two cups of coffee, and you're good to go. (laughs) (laughs) That's fantastic. I I like one thing that you say in your new book, and we'll get to the book here in a a little bit, but involve your child in the process as much as possible. I think that's got to be a key point because it seems like parents just want to take this and run with it because they know what's best for junior. That and let's add even onto that in a broader sense, you know, sometimes parents sort of want to shelter or do it for their oh. students. So to involve them and let them be the person leading the process is huge because as you and I know, there's life after college. You know, you have to get an apartment and a job, maybe turn the lights on or whatever it is. So the more that they own the process, the more comfortable they're going to be leading the process. Also, though, I think we have to set things up for financial aid, I think. And, and does that process also start early, making sure that our eggs are in the right basket? Yeah, I mean, you can start as early as the day if you if you can, you know, the day your student is born or your child is born, you can start at 529. If you're able to save, you know, that's great. And that will help with college. And then planning to apply for financial aid is part of the process. So doing that usually happens, you know, working that 
basket of eggs, like you were just saying, uh, freshman year, sophomore year, year, and then actually applying for financial aid senior year. There are some keys that I think a lot of people listening don't know to financial aid. It's my understanding that money in the student's name gets, I, I guess we'll call it a tax, right? Because more, more, um, uh, more financial aid is taken away because of money in a student's name than in a kid's name when it comes to what they call the FAFSA. Dig me out of this hole, Jody. What am I talking yeah. about? <laughs> no, you're doing you're doing well. You're doing well. I mean, you you really came to the table prepared. So yes, <laughs> the money in the student's name actually, let's just call it gets dinged, you know, so everyone understands a little bit higher percentage rate than in a parent's name. So if you have, for instance, a 529 where the parent is the custodial of the account and the student it gets dinged less. You can see me doing air quotes over here, right? Right. And then, <laughs> and then if it's in the student's name, like you have a UTMA or a UGMA, that's going to be dinged a little bit more. But if you have money that you've saved, that's a plus. So all in all, use that money to pay for college because that's, as parents, you know, we obviously want to use the money we've saved because that's why we saved it to pay for it. And so many people got into so much student loan debt. How do we avoid that problem? You know, I'm a fan of being an educated borrower. So if borrowing is part of your process, because you are not going to tell your student, no, they can't go to that college that they applied to and got into, then be a responsible borrower. And if, you know, if something happens in your family where maybe the recession happened and things weren't working out and you have to take out loans, then just know that you have to pay them back and how you're going to pay them back. I know that there's this big student loan debt conversation, but I do work with a lot of parents who say, you know what, Johnny worked really hard and got into this school and I want to do what I can. So if that's the case, okay, no one's judging. Just make sure that you understand that a loan needs to be paid back. Yeah. So there's a strategy before school starts, not after. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You talk about maximizing free money in, in your book, using scholarships, grants, and other awards that don't need to pay back is step one. Clearly, if I don't have to pay back money, Jody, I like that the best. But, but, yeah. but how do I start that process? Where do I begin there? So you can begin by, you know, if they're, if, you, if a student has a certain grade level or a certain test score and they receive merit money, that's a bucket of free money that they can use at that college. And then if a student receives uh, financial aid where um, they're need-based, that's maybe free money, state money, if they're eligible, that's another bucket of money you can use to hit that cost. And then if they ap apply for private scholarships and they win those, like the Kentucky Fried Chicken Scholarship or the Make a Prom Tress out of Duct Tape, they can they can uh, use that scholarship money to pay for the cost. So there's different buckets of money to pay for that bill. Is there a resource that you like best for those private scholarships? Um, I'm a fan of different resources. So I like FastWeb. I like Chegg.com. I like um, Discover has some great scholarships. So I'm a fan of Google too. Just look for a scholarship <laughs> right. in your interest and Google it and everything will pop up in your hands. I've never heard of that Google thing. The other ones <laughs> yeah. I know. but Yeah. The, yeah. And, and tell me, tell me there really is a prom dress out of duct tape scholarship. 100%. Is there 100%. really? Yeah, there's a, and then there's how to ask someone to prom scholarship. So yeah, there's <laughs> great ones out there. I want to transition to older students because something else I heard that I want to bounce off you is that, you know, private scholarships often are offered by companies and a lot of them use these scholarships, Jody, as you know, as recruiting tools. So they're mm -hmm. more interested in maybe not junior, but a lot of people listening that might be going back to school. So if you're going back to school, looking at private money might be more advantageous than it is for junior. Is that true or am I making that up? You are not making that up. In fact, I work with a lot of students who are adult learners who are going back to school. I worked with some who worked for Boeing. They worked for bigger companies. They worked for grocery stores and they went back to school. They got their education for free. Plus, some, some of them qualified for financial aid and they were able to get their bachelor's degree or an undergraduate degree that they never finished earlier. And then they're promoted in their company. So I'm a fan. There's a lot of programs out there that you can take a look at, whether they're online programs or you go once a month. I, I'm a huge fan. Back to lessons that Junior needs to learn. What type of 
financial lessons are we trying to teach junior along the way as they're working their way through high school and college years to help them make better money decisions? I'm all about budgeting, expenses, learning what that is to pay the phone bill, that they have data plans on their cell phones, and also working. Um, I know that that's a strange thing, but if you imagine that these students are in high school, maybe learning some basic skills in summer jobs, uh, that's a way to look at what some income is coming in and maybe they have to either uh, donate money to a charity or pay some bills. So just starting with the basics. How often if Junior's going away to college here in, in a month or maybe in the next couple of weeks, depending on, you know, when the right, school, right, right, right. When the school starts, uh, uh, how often th- – this is a question less about financial aid and more about people and just in general – kids and students. How often should I call my student when they go away to college? Uh, I think that that rules change, to be honest. I tend to say your student's going to call you. Even if they weren't talking to you during high school, they're going to get to college and they're going to have all new friends and they're probably going to want to look busy on their way from class to class. And you'll be amazed on how the calling time goes up to more than twice or three times a day. <laughs> so I think they're going to end up calling you. And if you don't call them, you might want to pick a time where you think they're not sleeping or out late so that they can communicate. And if you're getting that idea that they're not so open, that that might not be a great time to be communicating or reaching out. Text is good too. And if they're if they're not calling you, should you pick up the phone a lot? I mean, I see I see some of these parents. The reason I ask is I see some of these uh-huh. parents. It seems like they're calling their kid way too much. Like the kid has no room to breathe in school. Yeah, I mean, I I'm not a fan. You know, I I think that they're going to end up calling and reaching out to you more often. And if mom is mom needs to mom and dad might need to sort of take a break and let them sort of live their life and figure out what the next chapter looks like. So maybe cut one apron string. Let's let's get back to saving for college. <laughs> uh, uh, Five twenty nine savings plans. It, every well, I think every state has one. It, <laughs> it, it, are there some you like better than others? You know, I just like them in general. So let's just tell everyone that if you can open a 529 for your okay. student, um, I I don't know the states, you know, I'm not going to say that I know the states, so I don't know the states that have a better plan, but do it. I just became a grandma and um, my little granddaughter is getting a 529. Um, so, you know, search it out, do your research again, Google's your friend and get those 529s going. That's exciting. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, that is so cool. So you get to spoil a uh, grandchild rotten and then the kid goes home that's good a hundred percent now now when it comes to picking schools you have a list in your book of some of the different things people should be looking for in schools what, what generally makes somebody's top 10 list in the schools that they're looking for Well, I think before people see me, you know, they're really focused on admissions. I'm the sort of the financial aid numbers girl. So they're looking at location, size of campus, you know, it's a big school, little school, do they have fraternity, sports team? But then I bring the next piece in which says, is it cost effective? You know, do you have a good list that's cost effective? Do you have like a state school, a public school, a private school? Don't be afraid of private schools. They might be high priced but you might get some aid or free money like we were talking earlier to mark that price down. So have a good, solid list because there's going to be a point, Joe, where kids are going to apply and colleges are going to say no. So you want to have a good list to choose from when it comes to making a choice where the student wants to go. Oh, they won't say no to my kid, Jody. Of course. Right. I forgot about that. Except, yeah, <laughs> right. you're right. You're right. right. My, I meant to say that. <laughs> my, my kid's going to get accepted everywhere. And, everywhere. And, and I think what a lot of people don't realize is that these colleges have uh, have a cost to apply. And I see some people, you know, that think they're going to apply to 15 or 20. How far down should we narrow our list before we actually apply? Should we only apply to three or four or what should that process look like? You know, so funny that you mentioned that because uh, I, ha- I met with a family yesterday and, uh, you know, the student had like 25 schools on the list. And I finally looked at the parents and said, you know, I know this is your first one or your only one. If it, he doesn't have any siblings. And like, do you understand that it's like $75 to apply to all of these? <laughs> and then, you know, for financial aid, it's obviously free for the FAFSA. But then if the CSS profile is in this, it's $16, you know, per school. 
So a good list is, I think, five to ten. Five to ten. Yeah, that's a good number. Important dates for people. I guess the first important date would be early acceptance dates and those generally in the fall. Yeah. So uh, what's coming up for our, you know, rising seniors, anyone who's listening in that sense, if you're going to go early action or early decision, the colleges for admissions might have a November 1st or November 15th deadline. And the FAFSA for the very first time ever is going to go live on October 1st this year, 2016. I'm calling it our sweet 16 because we have two FAFSA processes. But the one for parents now is going October 1st. So everyone mark that in their calendars. And the CSS profile is also going to go October 1st too. Wow, that's way changed. Yes, way changed. And So if you have early admission deadlines, you really need to get on the system right now so that you're ready for that November 1st where your admission application will be due, your FAFSA will be due, and your CSS profile. So take a look at the websites to get those dates in order. And then uh, any dates in the spring that we need to know about, Jody? So still the admission dates are rolling out in spring. So far, there has not been an announcement that that's going to change. So colleges or students who are applying regular decision, those admissions are still going to come out in the spring. And until we hear something else, you know, I'll kind of keep you guys posted as we go along through social media. We're talking to Jody Oaken, who is the, the, I'm going to call you the financial aid pro, capital T-H-E. Oh my gosh, I'm blushing. The, the, The book is Secrets of a Financial Aid Pro, Master the College Funding Process, and Give Your Child Lifelong Financial Skills Without Losing Your Cool. And what's funny is, Jody, it doesn't have to be for your child, for people listening to this, if you're going back to school, I'd say more than two thirds of this book is even for them. Yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't want a how-to book. I wanted a book that was evergreen. And so that's sort of what I did. It's in three parts. Part one, making the most of the school day. So starting in middle school and then what to do each year and then paying the way. So as you're going through school and then, uh, and then why can't freshmen manage their money better, which is my favorite part of part three. Cause I've always, <laughs> uh, uh, it was funny, you know, when I got to college, I worked for American Express after college, but wow, what, that's what, great. Well, which is funny because the joke was on them because my freshman year of college, they had a they had a table in the hall, and uh-huh. I'd never had any financial training, and I just wanted a free stadium blanket, so I signed up for an American <laughs> Express card. I got one, Jody, and within sixty days, it was taken away because I never I, I was at a military college. There was no way I was going to pay my bill. And right. It's. I think it's so important for kids to learn those lessons before they go to school. I do too. I am a huge fan of learning how to pay your bills. Even if parents say, you know, I'm going to help you do X, let the student actually go online and learn how to do X, how to sign up and get their online account and get their username and password. Like we need to not shelter them and to let them learn these life skills that they're going to be doing, as you and I know, forever after college, which is only four or five or six years. Any one piece of advice that you found while writing this book is probably the big bombshell that most people have never heard before? I guess my tagline would be have that money talk and continue to have it and continue to unfold it. And even as hard as it's going to be for us as parents, because we maybe didn't make good choices or maybe things have happened and we might be embarrassed and it's hard for us to do it and talk about it with our student. That is the best gift we can give our student ever. Hey, trivia fans, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and this is amazing. Well, kind of amazing. I mean, Snoop Doggy Dog is upstairs with mom. That's incredible. Mom's got his special brownies in the oven. He's pacing around and giggling like a dentist who just walked into Arkansas. I got to get back up there. But first, let's talk student loan trivia. How much student loan debt is there in the United States? The answer right after mom and I give Snoop the biggest thrill of his life. Do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. Well, you know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing too, because you already have so much to do around your home. So go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. Hey, stackers, pay your credit cards off in full every month. Well, 
If so, you may know that any credit card can offer cash back, but only Discover matches all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year. It's like getting one of those birthday cards that's shaped like cash, so you already know there's cash inside before you open it. But in this case, it's stuffed with your first year cash back match, and you don't even have to send a thank you note. Cash back match only by Discover card. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Discover something brighter. Hey everyone, it's Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Wow, that was weird. We opened up the oven. Snoop was all excited to get a brownie. He ate one and he spit it out. He said, dude, I thought there was like special in these. Mom said, there is butterscotch chocolate chips. And watch your mouth, young man, she said. And he storms out of here, right out the door. What did he want, walnuts? The question was, how much student loan debt is there in the United States? The answer? Well, according to MarketWatch.com, the U.S. student loan debt stands at a whopping $1.3 trillion. Worse, credit card debt in the USA is only $787 billion. Only, right. Just more than half of the problem that student loans is. I'd worry about that, but I got to go catch up with Snoop. See ya! Man, you got the credit card debt, right? I arguably got the other one pretty gosh darn correct as well. Well, you only said one trillion. You say one point three trillion. You What's missed- a third of a trillion between <laughs> friends? It's a rounding error at that point. Can you believe the problem is double though? That's horrible. Thanks to Jody Oaken for stopping by the basement. Yeah, that's pretty it's nice. it's amazing. Uh, the the stuff that that woman has forgotten is more than most people know about college planning. But you know, she makes a good point. Start early. When it comes to college, you almost have to start like a freshman, right in high school. Start thinking about what programs you're going to be involved in. Well, she and I didn't even talk about this. When you work with a new family and you're talking about the amount they want to save. So as you know, our partner, Kathleen, who does all the work. for this work. She seriously does everything. You and I talk on the microphone while Kathleen and Richie run around and take care of everything. But Kathleen just had a baby, little Clara. If you were Kathleen's financial advisor, how much money per month would she need to start saving now so that she has no financial aid? Beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop. $400. Per month. Forever. That's well, a- not forever. For 22 years. Car payment. You're never going to see the car. Well, if your kid's a doctor, you might. <laughs> Hopefully. As long if as they don't. turns into underwater basket weaving. It might be a whole different thing. Unless underwater basket weaving becomes a high paying job. Starts. Which who it knows? Won't, it won't never be that, but. Who knows? We've got Julie. She's got a question for us now. Julie's on the Courtesy Outline. Say hello, Julie. Hi, Joe and OG. This is Julie calling you on the short wave from Canada. I have a question about saving and investment options for Americans living abroad. I'm a Canadian citizen, but my husband and young daughter are dual American and Canadian citizens. We plan to continue living in Canada and eventually retire here. We currently save for retirement in Canada's version of the traditional IRA, and we're able to save in the Canadian version of the Roth IRA, called the Tax-Free Savings Account, or TFSA, but in my name only. This is because of the IRS's definition of a TFSA as a foreign trust, meaning an extra stack of paperwork that has to be filed with my husband's tax return every year, and on top of that, any gains in that tax-free account is fully taxed by the IRS anyway. The Canadian version of the 529 Education Savings Plan is similarly treated as a foreign trust. My question is whether American non-residents are able to open investing accounts within a tax-advantaged account like an IRA that are domiciled in the U.S. to avoid the foreign trust problem. I'm also curious if separated enlisted service members who are living overseas are eligible for any tax-advantaged investing options. My husband served as an airman before receiving his honorable discharge and moving to Canada. Merci for all your help, and keep up the good work, eh? Okay. Hey, Julie. A and B. (laughs) She she had to get that in there. Uh, Thanks for the question, Julie. Man, that's a tough one. How about that? that Toughy. Uh, I am going completely in the dark. And my guess is you've probably already, you've researched this. You've got a paragraph of info and I'm just going to fly blind. I do not. You know what I was going to say? We're just going to fly blind together. Cool. Here's my thinking. I think that since the U.S. taxes worldwide income, so if you work in another country, you still have to file your U.S. taxes and all that sort of stuff. And you get a foreign tax credit and that sort of thing. 
I believe that you would be eligible to contribute to a U.S.-based retirement account if you had U.S.-based income. There has to be an expat CPA expert in our listening audience that will be able to set this exactly straight. But that is my that is my off the cuff answer. I was going to recommend our friend Doug Goldstein, OG, because Doug Goldstein works with a lot of people who are either U.S. citizens or in a U.S. citizen relationship and works with this issue all the time. That is his uh, specialty. Doug has the popular podcast Goldstein on Gelt. I will give her Doug's information because that is his wheelhouse. But there's also the question about airmen. Well, as a service member, and I think uh, she said that he was discharged. So, uh, so there's that. But um, uh, while a service member, you know, you can contribute to the TSP, which is the thrift savings plan, government's version of a 401k. But, but for uh, vets? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any special. I can't think of anything. Uh, retirement plan for that. Yeah. Talk to Goldstein. Yep. And I think that I'm pretty close on the, you got to have earned income. I know that a lot of uh, advisor friends of mine who have clients, let's say that they live in a border state and they have, might have clients that uh, maybe kind of go back and forth or live in, you know, live in Canada, but uh, work in North Dakota, right. you know, they're kind of right on the border. I know a lot of, uh, a lot of companies would require a U.S. based address in order to have an account. Now, some of the bigger firms, like maybe like, uh, like a Merrill or something like that, that is a little bit more global than a uh, smaller financial planning firm might, at, uh, yeah. might be a little bit more open to non residents. At my old firm, we always ran into trouble when a client would go overseas, even for six months, I'd run into big issues. Yeah. Uh, just uh, trying to it's something to do with licensing. And yep. if your client is in a place where you're not licensed, you're not really supposed to be able to take, instructions from them. I had a client that was like that too, that took an overseas assignment and he had to put his brother as a power of attorney. Right. So anyway, a lot of different pitfalls there. And uh, and that's more the advisory relationship. I don't know if that's for just having an account with, you know, a discount broker. Yeah, that's what I kind of mean. Like some of the bigger firms, a a local independent advisor might not be so awesome with that, but a larger uh, investment firm may. Doug Goldstein will definitely have the answer. And Julie, by the time Julie hears this, I would have hooked her up with Doug. But he's a great resource for people that are dealing with what Julie's dealing with. See that, OG? We don't know the answer, but we're able to hook people up with the right people. Well, actually, I take that back. We do have the right answer. Well, I'm pretty sure. Yes. Uh, (laughs) Because we hit pause for a second. We looked it up to make sure. No, I was right. Dang it. You know exactly that I was right, didn't I? And didn't I say I was right? You did say you were right, but then you hit pause to verify you were right because we want to be good about this. But anyway, that's good stuff. Yeah. You hit pause. I don't hit pause, man. This is a live show, man. You <laughs> keep it running, baby. Uh, thanks for the question, Julie. If you've got a question for the voicemail, uh, it's the courtesy hotline. If you've got a question for the courtesy hotline, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. If you just go to stackingbenjamins.com down the right hand side, also you'll see leave us a voicemail, and that's the courtesy hotline. Let's also go to the mailbag. Doug, as he was flying out the door to chase down Snoop Dogg, <laughs> Doug gave us some mail. This one comes to us from our friend Megan. Megan, of course, who loves Dave Ramsey. She actually, OG, gave us something to talk about. She said she'd like to hear uh, what we think about this particular article. So I thought this is good. It's a website called filmsforaction.org, and it's Your Lifestyle Has Already Been Designed, The Real Reason for the 40-Hour Workweek. This is by David King, and it's a personal blog. And David starts off by saying he's in the working world again, and he's now living a different lifestyle than while he was away, and that this transition to a 9-to-5 existence has exposed something about 9-to-5 people that he's overlooked before. He says since the moment he was offered his new job, He's been markedly more careless with his money. Not stupid, just a little quick to pull out his wallet. As a small example, he's buying expensive coffees again, even though they aren't nearly as good as New Zealand's exceptional flat whites. Guy lives in New Zealand. And I don't get to savor the experience of drinking them on a sunny cafe patio anymore. When I was away, these purchases were less offhanded and I enjoyed them a lot more. He says he's not talking about big extravagant purchases. He's talking about small scale, casual promiscuous spending on stuff that doesn't really add a whole lot to his life, he says, and he won't actually get paid for another two weeks. So the funny thing he's saying is that the reason 
he's got to work so hard at his 40 hour a week job. Partly is because he spends so much time working at the 40 hour a week job. He, he designs his whole life around, well, I deserve this extra stuff that doesn't really help him. He doesn't feel better. He doesn't like it more. He just wastes money now. Yeah. That's a fantastic uh, observation. I mean, uh, you and I offline have recanted the woes of being a brand new advisor. And sometimes we get those questions of, Hey, I want to be an advisor. Is it, how awesome is it? When do I make my first million? You know, and you go, eh, there's a year I made 600 bucks. Right. And I remember talking to you about the whole concept of, you know, when I made 10,000, I thought, my gosh, if I could just make 30 grand, life would be perfect. And then you make 30 and you say, well, if I could just make 50, it would be awesome around here. Like I'd have so much extra money, it'd be crazy. And it's, ama- it's amazing because you and I know people that have been deep, deep into the six figures saying, well, if I can parlay that into 750. If I could just, if I could just get close to like 750, then I'd be fine. Yeah. And they, I could just get close to a million, then I would finally, I'd finally be able to make it. And there's a person who, who I know very well who owns a lot of cool stuff and he's completely bored and he doesn't, he, he just buys it because, and he yeah. thinks it's going to make him happy. And what's funny is he advises other people and he's a good financial advisor. And you can tell it hasn't added anything to his life, all his stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of research that says that money and happiness kind of stops at about 80,000. Right. Yeah. Like once you get to 80,000 in income, you know, cause then you go, well, I can look at another 10,000 in my bank account. I'm saying like if somebody has like $800,000 income, right. Or something, some really, you know, at that point they're just buying stuff because what else is there to do? Yeah. You know? So yeah, there's some, uh, there's some pitfalls to that about money expands, your life expands into the money as you allow it, which circles back, I think, to what we've always talked about, which is, and you turned me onto this, which was to put all of my compensation into one account, but then pay myself weekly what my lifestyle need really is. And that is now my spending money. A set amount of money. Yeah. And then the rest of the money stays in the savings account. Then once, you know, once every couple of months, you know, sit down and allocate that that uh, that difference. This piece is actually about later on talks about this documentary called The Corporation. It kind of takes a right hand turn talking about how he works so hard for his money, but then he spends it carelessly. But in this documentary, a marketing psychologist discussed one of the methods she used to increase sales. Her staff carried out a study on what effect the nagging of children had on their parents likely to buying a toy for them. They found out that 20 to 40 percent of the purchases of their toys would not have occurred If the child hadn't nagged and I hope parents, you don't have kids listen to this because they found the secret key, bug the crap out of your parents for it. And they'll probably give it to you. Yes and no. But remember this, remember this from sales, you know, early, early sales training that a lot of people would talk about and use kids as an example. Like how long do you give your kids uh, a chance to learn how to walk before you cut them down and go, you're just not going to be able to do it. They try, 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 try. And I distinctly remember an audio thing, and I think it was Mark Victor Hansen, Chicken Soup for the Soul story. I think that's what it was. So somebody has the other copy of this. I know they do (laughs) because I got one copy. I think they sold two. But um, it was a live event that he did, not the book, of course. The book (laughs) they sold sold a few. Maybe maybe a couple more than two. But anyway, he was telling a story about how his kids would be like, Dad, 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 Dad. Dad, 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 and they dance around. Your kids did this. My kids still do it, right? And then finally, you set the phone down. You go, "What?" And they say, uh, "Can I have a cookie?" Yeah, right. And you're like, "Oh my gosh, yes, have a cookie, right?" Because you're just now it's four fifty five and dinner's about to be served in twenty minutes, but you don't care. You're just like tired of them going, "Dad, dad, 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 dad." Dad, that's how I get everything I want out of you. Haven't you picked that up yet? Joe, <laughs> Joe, Joe, Joe. It's a good article. We'll link to this in the show notes. Thanks, Megan, for sending us this way. There's Some actually thoughts by th- Joe and OG. Th- th- there are a lot more thoughts in this piece, too. So Megan's even a deeper thinker than we are, which we already knew. <laughs> yes. We, we, we already knew. 82% of the world is a deep <laughs> thinker. Right. Thanks for the letter, Megan. If you've got a letter for the show, send those to my email, joe at stackofbenjamins.com, or you can send those directly to our email at stackofbenjamins.com. 
Thanks to everybody also who's left us reviews. Reviews help us find new listeners, and that's kind of the lifeblood of our show. If they, well, what's that? What's that uh, phrase? If uh, you know, if you're not growing, you're dying, right? And so we need to keep the show growing. So thanks to everybody who's helped us do that. It just takes a second. This review is by Conquer Twenty Something, and it says, "Don't at me." Five stars. And it says, want to spend a few hours a week learning absolutely nothing about personal financing and laughing uh, occasionally? This is the show for you. So see how easy that was? Thank you to Conquer 20-something. I like that name. If you could leave us a review, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever you listen, we'd very much appreciate it. Thank you. And that's it for today, man. We're going to say goodbye. Thanks to everybody for listening. Thanks to Jody Oakham for coming down to the basement but I'll tell you what's coming up on the show on Wednesday. Tiffany, the budget nista, Tiffany Aliche. She is somebody who got herself out of massive debt. She saved money when she was getting zero money in terms of her paycheck. She took the little bit of money that she was getting from the government while she was looking for a job, which, by the way, that's just a fantastic story. If, if somebody thinks that they're in a world of hurt when it comes to their family finances, Tiffany Aliche, she's got you beat. So the budget nista coming down to the basement. That's somebody also who's been all over the media. That woman is everywhere. It's incredible. So we'll see her on Wednesday or we'll see you over in the green room tomorrow where we'll have another Stacking Benjamins behind the scenes episode. So the lessons today, well, College planning might make the whole experience easier than just signing up for some classes and winging it. In the markets, while some people might say, sell everything, you should probably focus on your own plan. But the biggest lesson of all, if Snoop ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Special thanks to featured guest Jody Oaken, author of Secrets of a Financial Aid Pro. To find out more, visit jodyoaken.com or follow the link in the show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of the Free Financial Advisor, LLC. The show was created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and edited and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Special thanks to my new buddy, Big Al, on the corner of 4th and Main Street for helping me figure out the special ingredients Snoop Dogg wanted in the brownies. I don't think he's going to be my ice cream company spokesman, but at least he's leaving happy. In his own words, it was lit, yo. So, uh, you're a board game nerd. Who said that? Yeah, I don't know. While we were on our family quote vacation, end quote, <laughs> Which where is everyone funnier. was on vacation, but OG. Oh, it's funnier than anybody knows, right? Yeah. I should put a picture of my office. Did I ever text you a picture of my office from my quote vacation, end quote? No. Oh, I'm going to text you right now. You tell me if we should put this in the green room. Is it a picnic table? Oh, it's better. Anyway, so uh, we downloaded on the kids' iPads the movie or the game Ticket to Ride. So we would all sit in the uh, in the evening and we'd have our iPads and we'd play Ticket to Ride on the iPad, which I think is fantastic. You know, better than you know necessarily watching TV or whatever. It's so right? fun. So this past weekend, we just kind of hanging out at home, and and the kids are uh, getting a little restless. My brother's in town and his girlfriend. So we said, hey, you know what? Let's play Ticket to Ride. So we bust out Ticket to Ride, the um, the board game, the board game, the actual one. Now it's a five person. Bo- now we're at five. I love it. I love it. Right. And I said to both of the kids, my nine year old and my seven year old, I said, now, listen, guys, this game is going to piss you off because 
there's not enough tracks for people to use. So you're going to get, somebody's going to cut you off. And they don't even mean to. And they don't mean to, but you know, you can't, you got to just, you just play your thing, you know, just deal with it. Right. So my oldest figures out very quickly that his sole mission in life is to be the Jack wagon of the entire who cuts everybody off everyone but he doesn't pick on everyone who do you think he picks on just you no not me oh you're mrs og nope, oh her. his little brother his seven-year-old brother who is minding his own business doing the little two tracks doot, 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 doot. oh and his brother cuts him off going to boston so he goes doot, 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 and around and then he's got to go from boston to Winnipeg, and he doot, 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 he isn't even he, trying to win. No, oh gosh. Well, he was going for the longest track, so I just thought I could go around a couple of times. Oh, I ran out of train. Sorry, that's my oldest. Meanwhile, my seven year old is in full nuclear meltdown stage because he's like trying to get like four black cards to like get the Sault Ste. Marie to Toronto, and then my oldest goes <laughs> with four multicolors. He draws off the stack. Yeah. And when it's his turn, he just takes the multicolor. Look up. He drives out the four multicolors, slides them across the table and goes, right here, please. Four trains. Boom. So you look at his thing. My oldest train is like this big, like meandering, like middle of nowhere loop. Like every possible corner he could cut his brother off from, he did. And here's my, here's my, uh, my youngest is just like bawling and he's screaming and so I was like, hey, this is how the game's played, man. This is how it's game. So we get to the end of the game, and I, I told my oldest, I said, listen, you know, that was a pretty jack wagon way to play this game. I said, it's, he goes, it's just, it's just a game. That's how you play it. I said, I understand. I, I'm not going to tell you how to play the game, but the gloves are off, and your mother will whoop the crap out of you because she played this game a thousand times more <laughs> right, than you. Right. And I, she will I was school saying, you. That's exactly like messing with Cheryl. Cheryl hates playing that way. If yeah. you play it that way with her once, yeah, she, she will, will take you destroy out. Because you. Because she knows every possible combination. So you see like, you know, after you play Ticket to Ride a couple times, you see a guy go, ba-boom, ba-boom, with two big tracks. You go, oh, he's doing this route. Yep, he's going there. He's going there. It, so he's in, for a, he's in for a treat. So we get to the end and we do all the points. And my youngest... He's, you know, DFL, right? He's, he's got like 70 points or something right, like that. He's right. back. And I happened to win. I just got lucky and drew some good destinations that I already had. And, and so I'm all the way around. So I ended up one point behind him, but I lapped everybody, you know? <laughs> so you get back to the end and I said, see, youngest boy. I said, look, you know, looks like you beat your dad. And he looks at me and goes, dad, do you think I'm stupid? I know you went all the way around and you almost passed me again. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Oh. That's why it says eight and up on the box, not seven and up, because the seven-year-old takes it too personally. 